Uh, the next topic for uh, this session is systemic therapies of HCC in 2022, which will be given by a person who needs no introduction now, I think, because he's a champion from University of California. And thank you so much, Dr. Bilal Hamid, for earlier uh, very nice time, uh, NAFLD presentations. Just I wanted to say thanks for clearing the confusion of NAFLD and MAFLD. But do you know that there is another term introduced by Professor Rashid Kamal Bhatt? which is Geffeld, Gujranwala Associated Fatty Liver Disease. <laughs> Thank you so much. I think I'm the last time I'm here. I don't know if they haven't added anything else in the talk. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. So, uh, well, can I end with systemic therapy for hepatocellular cancer? Uh, thank you again, and thank you, Chairperson. Uh, again, uh, the main thing, uh, same disclosure, but I'm not an oncologist. This talk normally given by oncologists, so I'll give my hepatology point of view, and there will be many questions that comes in, and I'll try to uh, see how that will be. I think the landscape of systemic therapy is changing like political situation in Pakistan. Every time you open, there's something new going on, and so I'll try to summarize it. But the one thing in epidemiology point of view, hepatocellular cancer is rising its incidence and mortality worldwide and it's projected to be the third most common cause of cancer-related death by 2040. And this is some of one of the cancers that it's increasing in the US and they're already in Asia, we talked about it, but if you look at the better colon cancer screening, breast cancer screening, prostate cancer, so all these, the can in blue you'll see the decline in cancer, but liver cancer is increasing and there's a lot of investment and we know with more hep C SVR, we are seeing increase in fatty liver disease. We have been talked about that we believe that this will going to keep increasing. Now, when we talk about HCC, and there are amazing transplant centers which has been built and also non-transplant center, but we have learned to the process that for any cancer, especially HCC, you need to have a multidisciplinary care. And I think that's the word you are seeing very consistently, whether it's management of butt carry syndrome, even Wilson's disease and other condition. So in this one, we need to have, and still, rather than primary care in FLD, we believe in the US, especially hepatologists is the quarterback in this situation, right? Because then we, as a team, decide with the radiologist, interventional radiologist, hepatobiliary surgeon, and uh, pathologist if we need an oncologist. But oncology, you know, this is one of the cancers that we actually tell our patient that, you know, you do, first of all, majority of the time you don't need a biopsy, you can make a diagnosis without, because one thing commonly in America, that how can you tell me I have a cancer, you never took the tissue, right? And then why I'm not seeing an oncologist? So you have to explain that we have many things to offer, and, and also a cancer where you can actually transplant, which is also very unique. And you can have a vaccine to prevent the cancer, so it's very unique cancer overall. But at the same time, there are actually studies and data out there that the multidisciplinary care, which we call tumor board in America, actually have better outcomes, improved survival. So I know that there are a lot of tumor boards are here, but it has to be more formalized and keep it in persistently to have understanding. Now, when we talk about, again, going back in the systemic therapy, even our uh, advanced HCC, this landscape has a significant changing and it's still like, adding more and more medication. But 2007 was the first time we have a therapy, serafinib, that was approved, and that was the first time which showed some survival benefit. But almost took 11 years to have more. And since that time, we have started seeing a trend of a lot of medication. I'll talk about some of the first-line therapy and what is the second-line therapies which we are considering. But the, before we talk about, even in America, when we have a patient with, you know, we have seen, in fact, many patients who have progression while we are monitoring and doing treatment, but a lot of these patients are coming in with advanced cases and that's a failure of the system, that they are not getting the screening done. And even in countries like America, and I can imagine like resource countries, like, you know, we have few resources and you, you know, have seen much more cases. And I've seen like cases like, you know, sent by my family members and friend who already had portal vein involvement and big cancer and says like, can we do anything, young people? So I can imagine how scary it is. And so uh, this talk hopefully will be relevant about what we have. This is an updated uh, bar BCLC algorithm from 2022. But the talk is about systemic therapy. So we will kind of focus on that one. And 
in any and you know I'll kind of show you some our uh, NCI National Cancer Institute and other one so this is the first line treatment right now is uh, atezolizumab and pevacizumab or you know these uh, combination of turolumumab or turimumab and if not feasible then we have sorafenib, lenvetinib or the combination so we have multiple first line therapy and I'll show you what we have been recommended or what's the first line right now and then you have second line therapies and there are different approval but also there are now third line therapy and there's so many different clinical trials that has been going on that pretty soon you'll keep changing like every six months or a year there will be a new data comes in and will change the first line therapy there will be a second line therapy so this field is evolving very rapidly and we definitely need more so now oncologists in the past were not had too many things to offer but they have many things in our uh, in their own uh, armamentarium to offer few concepts when we talk about or talk about the studies in uh, HCC systemic therapies there are three terms you're gonna see on you know when you read the papers one is overall survival how patients does the second is progression free survival that patient like you know doesn't you know did not have progression you still see the cancer but they're alive and then overall response rate how the cancer look like and then uh, you know the response rate had used this uh, modified rhesus criteria which is response evaluation criteria in solid tumor and you know a lot of time when you show the data about cancer in, in, in cancer treatment like even if you improve one month mortality or two months that's considered pretty big so you know a lot of time we say like are we doing like three months increase in mortality and we are like subjecting patient to it but in cancer it is still a big deal not for us when we do liver transplant we expect like you know five years 80 90 percent survival so the first line treatment option that we talked about the sorafenib the sharp trial which we hear all the time and this was since we didn't have any treatment at that time they looked at sorafenib versus placebo and you can see the difference that 10.7 month versus 7.9 months again it was statistically significant and you can see the difference right and then there were other studies done in Asia and then you know whether you have hep C patient or hep B patient that would but this based on this trial the sorafenib was approved as the first line medication for uh, HCC now then we had another trial that came in uh, which was uh, in 2018 in uh, in Lancet it was comparison so when you already had one treatment that is approved then you cannot have a placebo arm right then you need to compare that originally treated and then the treatment and the how you decide is whether that medication is called non-inferiority trial right they do as good as that other trial so that would be so this study the reflect trial they have patients who were on serafinib versus lenvetinib uh, and then the lenvetinib arm shows like you know 13.6 versus 12.3 so it wasn't statistically significant but it fulfilled the non-inferiority trial that it works as good as serafinib so that can be also used as a first-line treatment now there are some like you know clinical factors that can help select early on this was my talk from like a year before that there were like evidence most of these trials were done in Charles A cirrhosis right so that is the one thing and if you look at them they have good performance status so that's the one thing whether you're doing liver transplant or something if someone is on a wheelchair cannot walk they're not candidate for any treatment and they exclude patients who have like greater than 50 percent liver involvement or main portal vein or bowel duct involvement but then there are some adverse effect profile but more and more data in sorafenib even child's p cirrhosis is there the real world so people have been used in child's p we have used it in our own colleges so there is uh, data that is present but then this trial that came in in new england medical journal in 2020 which is called i am brave 150 and again they had no combination again everything we talked about in medicine right in liver whether it's hepatitis c fatty liver disease and like the combination is like whether you are targeting two different thing and that would be better than a single agent so what they use this is a multi-center randomized controlled trial of locally advanced metastatic or unresectable with Charles A again ECOG performance status was good they wanted to look at the overall survival and progression free survival and there are 336 patient in uh, it is luzumab and bevuzumab arm and these are and sorafenib and these were uh, you know infusion that they were given and patients were Charles B and C were excluded and they were treatment so this was actually changed like if you look at it in blue 
and versus the red, right? The overall survival in this arm of Edizu and Bev was 19.2 months as compared to 13.4. Now, even if you compare to the first study in Sharp trial where they have it, so this was an improvement and it was, and the p-value was significant. And then not only overall survival was better, but also the median progression fee survival was 6.9 versus 4.3. There was a durable response in 40, 30% and complete response was seen in 8% in this uh, arm. So based on this data, it is now in the, in, in the US and other, I think in Europe also, this is now the first line treatment. This is the first line that we offer to these patients. If patient is not candidate for it, then they offer other treatment. And I have not seen recently serafinib given in the US. Again, it's still like cheaper, but you can see the difference, like how many difference, like, you know, five months or six months that you will gonna do it. They, and the uh, side effects were, you know, kind of similar. I would say that there was a little bit more discontinuation with that. Now, the one thing is important if you're using this medication, I know someone told me it's available like 600,000 rupees, but it's very expensive. So I don't know how many patients can afford it. But importantly, I think that is that there are increased portal hypertension and the guideline is you need to do an endoscopy and make sure they do not have varices or if they have history of GI bleed, that is the one thing that they would not. So all these patients need to get it done and that's, uh, you know, uh, uh, the pharmacy insert that you have to and we have to do it. So that's the only thing. There will be more diarrhea, there will be other symptoms that are being doing, but if you compare the discontinuation rate, it's 15% versus 10%. Now, this was an also very interesting, uh, you know, this was presented recently. Uh, it, this is called Hemalia study trial, where they have diff four different arms. The one was this like stride arm, they call it. It's a combination of new treatment of trilumumab and uh, uh, durwa that we call. One was the durwa alone, then serafinib arm and then they have also a different arm which got closed same thing that they have PS PCLC like stage they had no prior systemic therapy Charles A and uh, E got good performance status but also have no main portal vein thrombus and this does not require upper endoscopy and again the stride arm which is the combination arm did better and overall improvement survival and the single arm Durva was non inferior to serafinib. So these are, that's the reason it also got approved for a first line agent because it like non inferiority wise, it did really well. And if you look at the forest plots for stride versus serafinib, it more towards like, you know, the uh, stride arm. So again, this was actually better. And that is second line that we have seen, or if the patient does not, that it doesn't have a GI bleed, I've seen recently more of the oncologists going in that route. Again, in America, insurance approves it, and so, but there are still patients who insurance doesn't approve, they have to go with that different things. Now, again, also they've shown that this have a slightly better quality of life in this, but this data is still like need to be reviewed a little bit more versus serafinib. Now, there are many other agents as was telling, and some of are getting very close and they will be presented. And you can compare that different, and the one thing you see the trend is combination. So, you know, and that where, where you have some of these lenvitinib with Pempro versus this other therapies that you have, nivolumab, although it's not been approved second line, so they're using this combination. And they're comparing with different arms of the study and they're a good number of patients and they're waiting. So the LEAP002 uh, will be coming out soon. So we will gonna see how it looks like. Now, what are the options if you have progression to the first line therapy? So we have, again, if you look at it, uh, most of the studies in second line therapies were done on patients who were serafinib, right? And so they were called post-serafinib. If you are a patient on serafinib, that these are the three options you have done. Now we don't have studies that patients who fail, like, you know, because these are earlier agents, and most of the time, based on the guideline, they say to do or do another clinical trial. Because in America, there's so many clinical trials going on that you put patients, because you know that some of these newer agents will be much better, but you can use, and you know, in America, you can, if you are on serafinib, the other option will be recorafinib or other options that are present. But this is just to give you a little bit perspective, and we dividing time, uh, into different anti-angiogenic anti therapies, which has been evidence, and also this, uh, you know, immunotherapy, what we call immune checkpoint inhibitors, ICI, 
The one thing with ICI, we all have seen really bad GI and liver toxicity and a lot of patients do, so I just wanted to put, but these are all these agents are present. And as I mentioned earlier, these were all studies in patients who were already on serafinib. Now this was just to give you an idea, you don't have to look at it like, you know, or understand a little bit, but it's just the bottom line is that when the patients were given, now these patients had failed serafinib. So that's why you see that they were on placebo. They already, so these patients were already failed serafinib, they were on these medications, and then they added like, okay, you do either regorafinib arm, capozentim arm versus placebo. So that's why you see the placebo, and definitely there were more survival, or overall survival benefit in these patients. Now the one interesting thing is that ramirucumab is an interesting agent. It's been approved if you have an alpha fetoprotein of greater than 400, and that's the uh, biomarker, and this is the first, like, you know, the biomarker based approval that is in the HCC. Now these are some of the other like key second line therapies that pembrolizumab and nevolumab and imulapinib therapy. So again, these are some of these agents that are present, but there are other many agents that will be on that timeline. So NCCN also have the similar guidelines. This is an American National Comprehensive Network. And in the end, like the first line therapy right now that has been in Charles A only, that you use adesolizumab and bevozuzumab arm, the other recommended regimen, so, you know, serafinib, you have, you have lenvatinib, and the other two options are there. And in certain scenarios, it's still like nevolumab can be used. And although it says Charles A, serafinib has been used in Charles B. And you know, again, that's been. And then you have this laundry list of all there, like, you know, second. The good thing about like, ca you know, cancer, if you talk to any oncologist, it's all driven by protocol. You just like look at it and then given it. So I always tell you, you don't think, you just look at the protocol and then the, so they, they make these protocols very easy so you can get it and you know these. So they follow these things because if any question that comes in that they send it to us. And so in Charles B. cirrhosis, they also have used nevolumab, although the data is not, but that is one of the options that they have been used. And this is just a laundry list of all these ongoing clinical, just like NASH, there's a lot of interest in it and we are fine, but the combination, you can see that there are anti-PD-1 and PDL one and also immune checkpoint inhibitors and sometimes are more advanced stages, so, and then some are country specific also, but the, the point is that next year if you give it, every year I think I'm giving this talk and every year, I thought I can use the same slide and I have to like change the presentation all over again because there's so much data that's coming out. So in summary, the multiple first line treatment are options, which gives us more our oncologists that they can choose, but at least right now you can have etiluzumab and pevozumab and based on the stride data, these both can be used and you have other options if patients are not. And so, Although in America it's, it's hard in Pakistan, but that is the first line systemic therapy. And uh, the second line options are present. But the important thing is that these patients are living longer. So average these patients before that, now they are, I have patients like six years, metastatic HCC and doing. Now that's the bigger question that now kind of come in at one point that about liver transplant, that we are talking about patients who are outside criteria, who are in, uh, you know, who had um, outside UCSF criteria or downstaging, whether, what are you looking for? If they have on these medication three or four years survival, is that better or you're gonna give them a transplant with high risk of ACC recurrence? So that field will gonna change. And also the new trend is that there are certain group of patients we are using systemic therapy and local regional therapy early on. So I think that will be the field that will be going in. Uh, we will have precision medicine that we use the word more and more about it, but you know, just like lung cancer, there will be specific, we can target these and better. And then cost and availability will continue to be a major barrier in many countries. And I think that would be the biggest thing. So screening, screening, screening. I think that's the key, find it out early and if you can cure it. And you know, we don't need to have this talk, hopefully they will be selected. So that's the end of it, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Bilal Hamid, for another excellent talk.